Hey everybody, it's great to see you today. Welcome to Living Power, your online Bible study where we are walking through the Bible in a year. Today is February 19th and we are in the book of Leviticus. This is another one of those sections that you've probably read many times and in your life, but probably skipped over them more than you've read them. Well, today we are going to find some nuggets in these chapters of Leviticus. We're in Leviticus 9 through 11, and we're going to talk about strange fire, and we're going to identify and try to define what was so strange about the this whole sacrifice. No, it wasn't a sacrifice, really. It was the way that Nadab and Abihu burned incense and then lost their life because of it. What was so bad about that? We're going to get into that in depth today, and I've got a great application for you at the end of the lesson today. Okay, the, the points that I'm seeing about the priests, the work of the priests, let's talk about that today. The priests were ordained publicly, as God specified and where he specified. I'm finding it so interesting, aren't you, that God wants to be worshipped as he dictates. He wants things to be specified. Well, he specifies, and he wants them to be carried out according to his specifications. I find this to be very, very enlightening. So the priests are ordained publicly. Notice this is just amazing to me. Notice that the fire that ignites the altar, the sacrifice, has to be burned up. There has to be fire. Notice who lights the fire on the altar today. We are in Leviticus chapter 9, verse 24. Let me read this to you really quickly. It says, Fire blazed forth from the Lord's presence and consumed the burnt offering and the fat. On the altar. This is the main altar where the animal was inside the ta the tabernacle courtyard. This would have been the um, the sacrifice for the sins of the people. The answer is that the Lord lit the altar, and it was a sign of Him accepting accepting this sacrifice. And so, fire came down from heaven. God lit the altar, and it says the people. When the people saw this, they shouted for joy and they fell face down on the ground. This is a typical response all through the Bible when people come in contact with the Holy God. They're joyful and yet they're fearful and they bow down in reverence at the same time. These two seemingly conflicting emotions but are ever present when people come in contact in face to face with their God. This was um, not the only time. Um, I recall some of, some other times that God has actually rained fire down from heaven and lit an altar himself. Do you remember any other time in scripture that you've read about that happening? I can think of two other times. The first one was when Solomon was dedicating the temple in 2 Chronicles 7.1. God lit that fire also. Remember also Elijah when he was coming against all the priests of the idolatrous god Baal. He had that contest in the valley of Megiddo. And remember he drenched his altar with water and then asked the Lord to rain down fire on his altar. It was a contest between God and Baal. And God lit that altar um, ignited it in flames, and it was drenched with water. That's in 1 Kings 18.38. You know, this whole concept of fire raining down from heaven reminds me of the New Testament contemporary concept of the Holy Spirit. You know, the Holy Spirit there in the Methodist church, they have a symbol. It's, it's fire. It's a flame. And that means that's a symbol of the Holy Spirit lighting a fire coming to live inside of us. So every time I read about fire coming down from heaven, I think about how the Lord today ignites sacrifices of praise and sacrifices of worship in the hearts of his worshipers today as he sends down and rains down fire in the form of his Holy Spirit. I just love thinking about that. 
Here's something else about the reading. Moses had been offering sacrifices previously. This is the first time Aaron and his sons are participating in that and are offering sacrifices too. Now, the priests had to offer sacrifices for themselves first. Themselves first. They had to be covered. Their sin had to be covered first before they could offer sacrifices to cover the sins of the people. And I found it interesting in if we go to a New Testament scripture in Hebrews 7, 25 to 28, it says, Jesus, he was our high priest. He is our high priest today. It says, Jesus did not need to offer sacrifices for himself every day, unlike the priests of the Old Testament, because he lived a sinless life and he is our perfect high priest forever. So I just want you to notice that that difference is that it called for the high priest to offer sacrifices to cover their own sin, but of course this was something Jesus did not have to do because he was sinless in and of its himself. Now the order of the sacrifices is significant. I don't want you to miss this. First, you must, and I say you plural, all of the worshipers, it, it holds true for everyone, you must deal with your own sin first. Now, we cannot cover our own sin. People have tried it in the past. It can't be done. That's why the blood of Jesus, the sacrifice that he made for you and me on the cross, deals with that. It covers our sin completely. Once that is taken care of, number two, you then dedicate yourself to the Lord. Once you've done that, number three, you can enjoy fellowship with him. You see, it is impossible for a person to enjoy fellowship with God without being completely washed of sin. And that is why we understand the way to the Father is through the Son, through Jesus Christ, because Jesus Christ covers, number one, He takes care of the washing away of our sin so that we can have fellowship with God. Now, there are two priestly blessings that I want to point out to you today. We're still in Leviticus chapter 9. I want to read to you, for those of you who might be in the car or not watching the video today, can't pull out your Bible, I want to read to you verse 22 and 23. This is where we find the two priestly blessings in the scripture. Notice as I'm reading, and when we'll cover this, when did the blessings take place? This is what we're looking for today. Let's look at verse 22. Aaron raised his hands toward the people and he blessed them. Okay, this is the first blessing. Then, after presenting, well, we don't need to continue on probably, but then after presenting the sin offering, the burnt offering, and the peace offering, he steps down from the altar. Okay, so picture Aaron. He's on the altar. There's sacrifices going on. But before that, he is giving a blessing. Hmm, this is one of two blessings. This blessing is after Aaron offers a sacrifice. Because if we have gone, if we go back to verse 18, we see Aaron had already slaughtered a bull and a ram for the people's peace offerings. He's, he'd splattered the blood and just as Moses had commanded. So Aaron had already made this particular sacrifice. Now he's blessing the people. Why is this so important? The order is important. Let me show you why. This reminds us that every blessing that we have comes because of the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. That particular sacrifice in verse 18 that preceded this blessing was the burnt offering, the slaughtering of the bull and the ram. Wouldn't you have loved to be there and have heard what priestly blessing he said? Well, we can probably know what he said if we go to Numbers chapter 6, verse 23 and 26. There is a priestly blessing there, and commentators believe that that could have been the priestly blessing that he gave at that time. So here's, here's the point. Spiritual blessings come because of fellowship with the Father, because of right standing that we have because our sins are washed away with the Father. Okay, that's the first priestly blessing. Let's look at the second one, verse 23. I'll read it to you. Here we go. Then Moses and Aaron went into the tabernacle. Only the priests are allowed inside the tabernacle. Who else is inside the tabernacle? 
God. And when they came back out, they blessed the people again. All right, timing is everything. So let's look at this. This is the second blessing. When did it happen? After Moses and Aaron spent time in the tabernacle, in communion, in fellowship with God. This reminds us that we must be in fellowship with God if we are to be a blessing to others. Now, let's jump over to the sin of Nadab and Abihu. I knew you wouldn't want me to skip over this. I wanted to cover this today because sometimes when you read something like this that's just a tragedy that happens to two people, your heart goes out to them and you think, you know, you, you might think something about God that you shouldn't and you just wonder, why did that happen? Well, I'm going to show you today many reasons, I bet you can guess how many reasons there are, why their action deserved this treatment and why they were absolutely wrong in so many ways in offering this incense, mm, sprinkling the incense and offering this sacrifice, if you will, in this way. There are actually seven wrongs with their behavior. I want to take you through them now. You know, the day began in joy. We have blessings on the people. We have sacrifices. The people have just seen fire come down from heaven. They know God is with them. Their God is present. And then, all of a sudden, by the end of the day, these two men have lost their life. Well, here's why. Number one, they were not supposed to be handling the incense in the first place. This was the role of the high priest. So number one, they were the wrong people. Number two, they were not supposed to use their own censors. <clears throat> they were supposed to use the high priest censor, and that censor was supposed to have been sanctified by anointing oil. So they were using the wrong instruments. Number three, they were not supposed to be lighting the incense at this time. It was only supposed to happen on the annual Day of Atonement, so it was the wrong time. Number four, they were not supposed to just do it without permission. They just kind of went ahead and did it. They did not ask Moses or Aaron, and if they had, Moses would have said, no, 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 this isn't how it's supposed to be done. That's supposed to be held for another day. So they were acting with the wrong authority. Number five, they were not supposed to do it the way they did it. They were supposed to use coals taken from the brazen altar, use those coals to light the incense, but they didn't do it that way. They used the wrong fire. That's why this is called strange fire. Number six, they did not glorify God the way he wanted to be worshipped. They were acting in the flesh. They were impulsive. We don't know exactly what their motives were, but perhaps they wanted to do it to be more esteemed or be more a part of the offerings of the Lord, and it wasn't as God had prescribed. So we'll say they had the wrong motive. And number seven, in verse 9 and 10 of Leviticus chapter 10, it implies that they had too much to drink. It implies that they were drunk and that they were under the influence. And here again, they were acting in their own flesh versus the power of the Spirit. So we'll say they were using the wrong power, the wrong energy. This was not the only time in Scripture. You know, I, I love to look at other places in Scripture and say, is this an isolated incident? No, it wasn't. This is not the only time something like this has happened. When Israel, we'll read about this um, over the, uh, the coming year. We haven't read about it yet, but there is a story we will get to. When Israel enters the Promised Land, a man named Achan, A-C-H-A-N, loses his life because of something that he does out of turn. When they move the ark in David's day to back to Jerusalem and they're transporting the ark and it falls off the cart, a man named um, Uzziah touches the ark against the ordinance of the law 
and he loses his life also. In the New Testament, I know you love New Testament references. In the New Testament, Ananias and Sapphira have trouble. One of them loses their life because they lie. They lie before Peter and the other disciples. And that was to teach a lesson that you we must not lie before God. That's in the book of Acts. So this is not an isolated incident. It is not the only time something like this has happened. Let me share with you the application for today. I think this is teaching us that if we want to be in service to God, we have to do it for His glory. He gets the credit. We have to do it, serve Him the way He wants to be served, following His commands to the letter, not just the way we want to serve Him. And if we want to be in service to God, we have to do it in a way that the Spirit leads us. We cannot be walking in the flesh with our own motives, our own thinking, but we have to, and in the New Testament it tells us, Live constantly in the power of the Spirit. And I would ask you today to pray to the Lord to reveal to you, what does that mean, Lord, to live constantly in the Spirit? We are told to walk in the Spirit continually. So it's not enough to just teach. We have to practice walking in the will of the Lord. And we have to be sure that the fire of our ministry doesn't come from fleshly motives. That would be strange fire to the Lord. But we have to be sure that the fire of our ministry comes from the Spirit and the power that comes from the Spirit of God because we're walking in the Spirit. So do you have any fleshly motives that you need to kind of get out of the way? Do you need to follow God's commands more rigor rigorously and stop fudging? Or perhaps you need to let God get more of the glory of the way you live your life instead of taking some of the credit for yourself. Just something to think about. I pray that this lesson has given you something to think about and has been a blessing to you this day that would encourage you to walk continuously in the power of the Holy Spirit. Blessings to you and your family. Until tomorrow. Shalom.